During my first year of law school, I was once arguing with a philosophy PhD about uh, legal policy, when in the midst of our argument, she said, a lot of people a lot smarter than you have supported my position. To which I responded, I might not be a philosopher, but I thought you all didn't go in for ad hominem arguments. In this lecture, I'm going to alert you to two forms of argumentation, ad hominem and slippery slope arguments that are often appropriately maligned. But I'm going to argue that there are circumstances, limited circumstances, where they can be valid parts of argumentation. So they are tools that can be deployed with discretion. And you should develop the ability to identify when you hear someone else uh, use them, as I did with the philosopher, and evaluate whether the argument is being used in one of those appropriate or inappropriate settings. A classic example of an ad hominem argument is to argue that vegetarianism is bad because Hitler was a vegetarian. Uh, <clears throat> the unstated and faulty premise is that somehow, because Hitler was a miscreant, everything he did was bad. Ad hominem arguments draw inferences from the quality or character of, the, of a person to judge the views uh, or the actions of that person. Uh, a more famous and effective kind of ad hominem argument uh, arose during the 1988 vice presidential debate uh, when Dan Quayle argued that he had, quote, as much experience in Congress as Jack Kennedy when he sought the presidency, unquote. His opponent, Lloyd Benson, responded, Senator, you're no Jack Kennedy, unquote. Ad hominem arguments are one form of prejudgment. Instead of judging the merits of the thing itself, we judge something seemingly related as a shortcut inference of quality. Analogous forms of argument draw inferences from institutions or groups of people. For example, she's probably smart because she graduated from Harvard Law School. Or, I'll probably like this cell phone because a lot of other people like me liked it. A limited defense of ad hominem arguments, and prejudgments for that matter, uh, is in circumstances where time is in short supply and we might want to draw probabilistic inferences, especially as a preliminary matter, instead of doing the harder work of evaluating the merits of the thing itself. But I emphasize the limitedness of this defense and how often ad hominem arguments are an unworthy rhetorical trick that attempts to substitute for substantive reasons. The second type of argumentation that I turn to now is often called a slippery slope. A slippery slope argument is of the form, if this, then that, and finally that. It gains its name from the metaphor that just as it's harder to maintain traction on a slippery slope of a hill, than on a place that is either flatter or has better footing, there are some arguments that are hard to maintain because their logic leads through a chain of related events eventually to an unpalatable implication. Frederick Schauer has provided a definitive analysis of slippery slope uh, arguments in a 1985 Harvard Law Review article with this same title that, quote, uh, exposes the foundations on which slippery slope claims must stand or fall." Unquote. That article forms the basis of this lecture. Justice Stewart once dissented, the camel's nose is in the, uh, the tent, unquote, to signal a slippery slope concern that the instant outcome uh, will ineluctably lead to a dangerous result in other cases. This kind of argument is also sometimes referred to as a foot in the door argument or the thin edge of the wedge. The song from the musical, The Music Man, uh, Trouble in River City, is an extended slippery slope argument. As Shower points out, it was not the pool table itself that was the ultimate cause of concern, but rather the fear that the presence of a pool table would lead to other activities that were inherently harmful, such as smoking, swearing, 
and other forms of uh, degradation. In law, for example, the argument is frequently heard that permitting one restriction on communication, a restriction not in itself troubling and perhaps even desirable, will increase the likelihood that subsequent courts will um, find that other increasingly invidious restrictions uh, are also allowable. If the police can constitutionally stop uh, the Nazis from marching in Skokie, Illinois, then what's to keep police from stopping other unpopular groups uh, from marching? More recently, the slippery slope argument has been used to argue if we pass the Equal Rights Amendment, we'll have to allow gay marriage. Or if we allow civil unions, we'll have to allow uh, same-sex marriage. In each of these contexts, the end result, metaphorically the bottom of the slope, is an undesired consequence or implication in the eyes of the person making the argument. Sometimes the argument is combined with what's called a parade of horribles, which are a sequence of undesired consequences, again to the person making the argument, as we slide down the slope. As in, if we allow same-sex marriage, we'll have to allow polygamy, incest, and ultimately, the legalization of bestiality. Paul Gewertz has argued in his article, The Jurisprudence of Hypotheticals, that courts should give less weight to hypothetical consequences that are merely theoretical possibilities with little uh, probability of arising in the future. You should also become adept at running slippery slope arguments both ways. For example, consider uh, a, a case of whether Pawtucket, Rhode Island should be allowed to erect a nativity scene on public property. If the, and if the court allows nativity scenes, it's only one small step to allowing organized prayers and religious services on public property. And then the next step is involvement of public officials in those services. And then official endorsement of particular re religious denominations, which is exactly what the Establishment Clause was originally designed to prevent. That's one way to run the argument. But you can also run it the other way. If the court doesn't allow the nativity scene, you could fear another kind of a slippery slope. The next step is allowing the courts to prohibit any mention of religion at all, including studying the Bible as literature in schools and hanging um, famous uh, religiously uh, inspired paintings in museums. Uh, and then the courts will prohibit any public official from mentioning, from mentioning religion. And before long, the courts will even prohibit fire and police protection of church buildings. The strength and appropriateness of a slippery slope argument turns on the plausibility that the future dangerous case will arise and on whether the future courts will have trouble distinguishing the present decision from the future variation. Schauer emphasizes that slippery slope arguments force decision makers to focus on the future implications of what they do today. Because of the precedential nature of law, slippery slope arguments are particularly important with regard to legal decision making. Other decision making processes, such as electoral politics, is more often focused on the necessity of the now, of the current moment. In the voting booth, the, electric, the electorate might more easily avoid the slippery slope by just voting no to a subsequent result but courts may have a harder time avoiding the implications of the pr principles underlying what they announce today. To be responsive, simply means to answer the question that was asked. It sounds simple, but a surprising number of people from presidential candidates to loved ones fail at this simple task. For example, consider the question, did you eat the last piece of cake? And followed by the answer, that's ridiculous, I hate cake. The answer is non-responsive. 
uh, it's a non-responsive response because it doesn't explicitly answer the question that was asked. The same answer would have been fine if it had simply begun with the word no. No, that's ridiculous. I hate cake. To be responsive doesn't mean that you have to limit your answer to the minimum number of syllables uh, possible, although there's something beautifully clean at times uh, in having a monosyllabic yes or no. Being responsive also doesn't mean that you have to know the correct answer to all questions. It's a supremely responsive answer to a yes-no question to say, I don't know, or it depends. Although if you say it depends, you should be prepared uh, to be asked the follow-up, it depends on what. To be responsive, you need to first develop the skill of carefully listening to the question that is being asked. Is the question calling for an open-ended list of reasons? Or is it asking you for, to choose among a limited set of possible answers? By the way, I find that some professors have very different mixtures of how what proportion of open-ended questions versus what proportion of yes-no questions they ask. Once you've identified what's being asked, the second skill is to begin your answer with the requested information. Beginning with the requested response helps the questioner by providing the information that the questioner is waiting to hear before going on to provide other types of information. In casual conversation, being responsive is a way of showing respect. Too many people are non-responsive because they think they really know what the questioner's deeper question is. For example, consider the question, is there still a piece of cake in the refrigerator? Answer, you wouldn't want to eat that cake, it tastes terrible. The respondent ignored the question, assuming that the questioner was interested in eating the last piece of cake. But it's possible that the questioner wanted to know about the cake's possible absent to figure out whether a child was inappropriately eating between meals. You dishonor your questioner when you ignore a question because you think the questioner asked the wrong question. It's so much easier to answer yes but you wouldn't want to eat it. Being responsive isn't just a good idea, it's the law. Witnesses are enjoined to be responsive when giving testimony. A classic moment of trial advocacy is for a counsel during cross-examination to intone, objection, non-responsive, move to strike, your honor, please instruct the witness to just answer the question. Indeed, while it is fine in class or in conversation to supplement your responsive answer with additional information, counsel can and do limit testimony to the more monosyllabic variety. Um, a counsel might say, just answer the question yes or no. Uh, did you wait two hours before calling the police? So you should strive to not just develop the skill of yourself being responsive, you should develop the ability to, know, to, do, to notice when other people aren't being responsive. Good lawyers hear a figurative buzzer go off in their heads when they hear someone fail to respond to a question. Practicing with your fellow students is a great place to start. My kids, when they were young, picked up this knack and are keenly attuned to my failings in this regard, taking great glee in catching me by pointing out, objection, non-responsive daddy. Responsiveness is also important in addressing the court at trial or in appellate advocacy. In the very first Supreme Court oral argument that I ever attended, Wygant versus Jackson Board of Education, I heard Justice O'Connor having to repeatedly ask the respondent to articulate what the state's compelling interest for race-conscious employment practice was. After the third try, she said with exasperation, quote, maybe I can't get an answer, but I'd really would like to know what the compelling state interest is, unquote. Antagonizing the judiciary is not the best way to further your client's interests. 
non-responsiveness played a small role in spurring me to organize a class action lawsuit against Yale University in 1984. Uh, it was in the fall semester of my second year when law school services were massively disrupted by a strike of clerical and maintenance workers. And I attended a town hall meeting uh, in the law school's largest auditorium where an associate dean explained that the school would be issuing rebates to students with meal contracts for every week the strike lasted. I asked the dean who calculated the amount of the weekly dining hall rebate. The dean responded, oh, it's just the prorated amount of what you paid. Uh, to which I said, non-responsive, but is it your view that the seller uh, in breach is allowed to unilaterally determine the amount of damages or that those damages are normally equal to a pro rata return of the price paid? The lawsuit might never have been filed if the dean had answered my initial who question. One of the classic evidentiary objections, along with non-responsiveness, is to say, objection, that question assumes a fact, not in evidence. The tool here is for you to be attuned to questions that proceed from a false premise, or even a premise that lacks an adequate evidentiary foundation. The objection is appropriate whenever a litigant asks a loaded question. Probably the most famous example used to teach this concept is the hypothetical cross-examination question, when did you stop beating your spouse? The assumes a fact objection is appropriate if there isn't an adequate evidentiary foundation that the witness A has a spouse, B at some point in the past had been beating his or her spouse, and C had at some point more recently stopped beating her. If you are asked a question that assumes a fact that is not only not in evidence but is in fact false, you should object and possibly respond with your own question. Who said I was married? Who said I ever beat my spouse? Who said I ever stopped? In the last lecture, I emphasized how many people fail to respond to the question asked. But the loaded question plays on the desire in some people to be responsive. If a CEO is asked, how can you justify your firm's price gouging of its customers? The questioner wins with either kind of normal responsiveness. Either the answer, the price gouging can't be justified, or the answer, the price gouging can be justified, implicitly acknowledges the premise that there's price gouging going on. This assumes a fact not in evidence objection gives you a new way to be responsive by challenging the question's presuppositions. You will be a star if you can catch one of your professors asking a loaded question and respond, objection, assumes a fact not in evidence. My kids, again, use this tool against me to their great amusement. For example, imagine my daughter tells me she had lunch at a fancy restaurant. I then ask her, were you the youngest uh, patron in the restaurant? What facts have I assumed in, uh, that are not in evidence when I ask this question? Can you see that there, the, it, that there were other patrons in the restaurant? Indeed, to be pedantic, there would need to be two or more other patrons for the superlative adjective youngest to be proper. If there was only one other patron, the appropriate question would be, were you the younger patron? I was once an expert witness in a glass ceiling uh, case for a plaintiff claiming that she was discriminated against uh, in promotion uh, by her phenomenally successful employer. During my deposition, the lawyer for the defendant asked me to answer a counterfactual question of the form, uh, 
If the plaintiff was a man and the following facts were true, would your answer be the same? I responded, the question inappropriately assumed a fact not in evidence. Can you see the lawyer's mistake? You see, by asking if the plaintiff was a man, the lawyer was implying that there was some non-remote possibility that the plaintiff was a man. The lawyer should have asked, quote, if the plaintiff were a man, unquote. Beyonce got this right when she sings, if I were a boy. During my deposition, after going back and forth a few rounds with the opposing lawyer, I finally asked him if he intended to use a different mood. Being a stickler about the subjunctive mood and superlative adjectives is, well, obnoxious. But paying attention to whether questions have an adequate and accurate evidentiary foundation is a skill well worth having. Statutory interpretation has semester-long courses devoted to the subject, so my goal here is simply to give you a brief introduction that I'll break into three take-home lessons. Lesson number one. To begin, it's useful to identify the subject and the verb of the statutory sentence you want to understand. For example, take a look at section 1103 of the Uniform Commercial Code. Unless displaced by the particular provisions of the Uniform Commercial Code, the principles of law and equity, including the law of merchant and the law relative to capacity to contract, principal and agent, estoppel, fraud, misrepresentation, duress, coercion, mistake, bankruptcy, and other validating or invalidating cause supplement its provisions. It's a mouthful. Now, start by Pick a single word as the subject of this sentence and another word as its verb. Hopefully, with a little work, you can see that principles is the subject of the sentence and that supplement is the verb. This gives you something to cling to and build upon. Does the sentence have an object? You bet. Its provisions. <laughs> and what does its refer to? Well, if you think about it, it's got to be the Uniform Commercial Code. And now you can go back and pick up other phrases and clauses. In this case, we learn that the principles of law and equity, including a bunch of other stuff that we'll come back to, supplement the UCC's provisions. Already, we've made a lot of progress. We know that a bunch of other sources of law, not written into the UCC, supplement its provisions. But we can't forget the initial uh, <coughs> uh, prepositional phrase. This supplementing doesn't occur if the principles of law and equity are displaced by particular provisions of the code. In terms of default rules, the common law of contract and a bunch of other things are still good law by default unless they are displaced by particular provisions of the UCC. Lesson number two. The great California Supreme Court Justice Roger Traynor in 1968 famously wrote that words do not have absolute and constant reference, unquote. Traynor was arguing for the necessity uh, to consider extrinsic evidence in order to interpret the meaning of a contract. There have been ongoing heated debates about whether and under what circumstances extrinsic evidence should be introduced into evidence to resolve ambiguity. Some have argued that extrinsic evidence appropriately constrains judicial interpretation of statutes and contracts. Others have claimed that introducing extrinsic evidence uh, sifted through the adversarial system gives the judge too much discretion to choose interpretations that diverge from what the parties, uh, the drafters of the, uh, of the contract or the statute really intended. Words may not have absolute reference, but they mean something. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't waste your time listening to me. One way to accommodate the possibility 
of limited ambiguity is to think about a statute in terms of a simple Venn diagram with this single circle in which every point inside the circle represents a possible interpretation of the text. And an unambiguous text would be a single point. An ambiguous text, like depicted here, would give rise to several points. But a somewhat ambiguous text still isn't susceptible to all interpretations. The points outside the circle represent interpretations to which the text is not reasonably susceptible. Imagine a statute says that it shall be a Class A misdemeanor for any person to cause a vehicle to enter, train, or park. The statute might be suscept reasonably susceptible to an interpretation that prohibits bicycles or even skateboards as vehicles, but the quoted sentence is not reasonably susceptible to the interpretation that citizens are required to carry firearms in the park. The latter interpretation would be represented by a point outside of the circle. When the text is ambiguous, interpreters sometimes admit extrinsic evidence to resolve the ambiguity. For statutes, the extrinsic evidence might be legislative history. For contracts, the extrinsic evidence might be parole evidence, testimony of the parties as to what they, their conversation was uh, when they were forming the contract. The additional evidence of what the drafters intended can help to narrow uh, the Venn diagram. But again, there are raging debates both uh, with regard to statute and contract interpretation about when and whether it's appropriate to admit extrinsic evidence. In contract law, after considering all of the allowable extrinsic evidence, if there still remains residual ambiguity, the courts next turn to rules of construction, such as choosing the interpretation that disfavors the drafter. This is the contra proferendum rule. Lesson number three, notwithstanding the foregoing tidy story of using extrinsic evidence and then rules of construction to resolve ambiguity, statutory and contractual interpretation has defied anything close to algorithmic treatment. Indeed, courts apply a host of interpretive canons, uh, most with impressive Latin names to help interpret statutes. In a famous 1950 article, Professor Carl Llewellyn showed that these canons were often oppositional. Different canons often led to opposite uh, interpretation. Here I'm going to mention just three of the more famous uh, interpretive canons, along with an example of how the canon uh, has been used. You might usefully show off in class by mentioning uh, one of these uh, Latin phrases uh, in interpreting a case. By the way, I've found that the better the lawyer, uh, the worse her pronunciation of Latin phrases. So don't get hung up about a uh, particular Latin interpretation. Um, uh, the first uh, interpretation I'm going to speak about is the uh, nascitur a uh, socis, uh, which might roughly be translated, it's known from its associates. The Factories Act of 1961 uh, required that, quote, floors, steps, stairs, uh, passageways, and gangways, unquote, had to be kept free from obstruction. A court in Pengley versus Bell, Bell Punch, uses a nascitur a uh mode of interpretation held that since all the other words were used to indicate passages, a floor used exclusively for storage did not fall within the act. The second uh, canon of interpretation is the uh, ejus dem generis uh, canon, uh, which means of the same kind, kind, class, or nature. In Powell versus Kempton Park race course, the House of Lords had to decide whether uh, the Betting Act of 1853, which prohibited the keeping of a house, office, room, or other place for the purposes of betting applied to the Tattersall's Ring, which was an outdoor arena for the race course. The court said it did not, as the specific places were all indoor places. However, if the words other place had been followed by a word like uh, wheresoever or whatsoever, the rule would not apply. 
And then finally, uh, you might want to uh, learn the canon that goes by the phrase expressio uh, unius. Uh, and the longer phrase is expressio unius es exclusio alterius. Uh, the inclusion of one thing implies the exclusion of the other, but people refer to this just as the expressio unius uh, method. So in, an example of it is in 1831, a court applied the expressio unius principle to find that the poor tax levied on occupiers of, quote, lands, houses, and coal mines, unquote, under the Poor Relief Act of 1601 could not be levied on owners of other types of mines, that the expression, that the inclusion of coal mines implicitly excluded other kinds of mines. Remember, I'm only scratching the surface on a vast and difficult subject, but this lecture hopefully can get you started. The most important advice here is to take the word brief seriously. Over the years, I've noticed an almost immutable tendency for students who write more extensive briefs, briefs for each case to quit briefing earlier in the semester. It's just not sustainable to write two pages in advance of class discussion for each case that you're assigned. Much better to find the 20 or so words that are most useful for you. Here's my suggestion for what those words should be. First, uh, your first line should have the case name with annotations indicating which party was the plaintiff and defendant and which party is the appellant or appellee. And, and depending on the course subject, I might add in additional abbreviations for which litigant was the patentee or who's the buyer and seller. In the first line, you should also include the year and the name of the court, or if the judge is a justice or a famous judge, put the judge's name in too. You probably already know that Justice Breyer is relatively liberal when it comes to constitutional law, but you probably don't know what his antitrust jurisprudence is. This simple technique of writing the name of the justice when you brief a case will let you easily start developing fuller pictures of the uh, judicial philosophy of individual justices. So, for example, the first line uh, might say, Jacob and Young's versus Kent. And here, this tells me that Jacob and Young's was the plaintiff, uh, uh, the appellant. I use T and E for appellant and appellee. Uh, uh, respectively, and in this case, it's a contracts case, the S indicates that Jacob and Young was the seller, in this case of services. And Kent was the defendant, and the appellee, and the buyer. Now you could leave out this uh, and infer it from the first parenthetical, but I like to have it there so I can look quick, uh, directly at Kent and know who he or she was. Uh, the case was decided in 1921, uh, uh, in New York, uh, Court of Appeals, uh, which is uh, the highest court of New York, and it was decided by uh, uh, Justice Cardozo. All that's what's in, uh, what I learned from just the first line. Second, I summarize the procedural history uh, by indicating who won below. In this case, I know that in the initial trial court, the defendant won. And that in the initial, and that in the case I just read, which is underlined, I know who won, that the plaintiff won a, a new trial. Third, I then try to summarize the facts of the case in a single declarative sentence. Here, the builder fails to install promised reading pipe. Fourth, I then try to summarize the central legal conclusion. Some people prefer to have question and answer. Can the buyer refuse to pay for insubstantial seller breach? Uh, no, but I prefer to state the issue as a conclusion. 
these conclusions are the rules that you will take from the case. For example, here I would instead uh, write down, buyer can't refuse to pay uh, for insubstantial seller breach. Sometimes there's more than one issue to summarize. So in this case, I might also add in that uh, not just that the buyer can't refuse to pay for an insubstantial seller breach, uh, when there is an insubstantial seller breach, but that damages for insubstantial and non-willful seller breach may be limited to diminution in buyer value instead of cost of performance. Those are the two rules you might get from the case. You might also deploy some of the categories that you've learned in these lectures to help categorize uh, the rules of the case. For example, is the rule of the case a default or is it a mandatory rule? Is it a standard or is it a rule? Fifth and finally, I sometimes would add a sentence summarizing the legal or policy rationale for the rule. For example, for this case, I might add a uh, substantial performance rule deters buyer and seller uh, opportunism. Put these all together and voila, you have uh, a case brief uh, that again lists the key aspect of who the parties are, tells you the procedural history, summarizes the facts, the legal rules, and gives the legal uh, policy. My computer tells me this summary is just 65 words long. When it comes time to prepare for final exam, you should condense this brief even further. I re recommend for exam prep that you condense the initial brief down to something that is uh, Twitter length of 140 uh, characters that summarizes the rules that you learn from the case. For example, in this example, I, I might uh, say Jacob and Young's reading, reading pipe, buyer can't cancel for insubstantial non-willful breach, cost of performance can overcompensate, which again my computer tells me is just 122 uh, svelte characters. For homework discussion, use uh, the method uh, that described here to brief uh, the case that I have included in the course materials, or pick one of your own. Remember, be concise. Many beginning law students feel very nervous about being called upon in class. They're not accustomed to the Socratic method of questioning. They're thrown by the sheer size of the class because they've grown used to the seminar-sized classes more common at the college level. For some, this anxiety is so acute that their minds go blank as soon as their names are called. Even if you feel a milder sort of anxiety when called upon in class, you can begin to overcome this fear in a counterintuitive way by raising your hand and volunteering to speak. The key is to prepare a question or comment in advance that is related to a, uh, a case, statute, or rule that you've been assigned to study. The question can be very concrete. If the plaintiff wanted to give the defendant notice by attaching land, would the plaintiff also post a sign somewhere on the land itself? Or it could be abstract. What does the court mean when it says blank? You could also use your question to tie two or more cases together. Is the court's conception of possession in this case more demanding than we saw yesterday in the case of X? To do this properly, you should actually write the question down. At home, on the night before class, you should practice speaking the question out loud to make sure you can articulate as clearly as possible what you want to say. It can be scary to raise your hand and ask a question or make a comment, but when you do so, you're in charge of what you're going to say instead of being forced to respond to a question chosen by the professor. And some professors will not call on you or ask you as many questions when they do if you've volunteered recently. Second, 
Learn to become comfortable with silence, both before and after you speak. One of the most powerful tools when taking a deposition is to utilize the discomfort that most people have with silence. If a lawyer asks a deponent, tell me all the ways your parenting style may have been flawed or misguided, the deponent will give an initial answer. But just by waiting and letting silence fill the room, the lawyer can sometimes cause the deponent to add additional words that he or she wasn't planning on saying. When a professor asks you a question, listen to the question and first and foremost be responsive. And after you've said what you wanted to say, stop speaking and be comfortable with letting silence ensue. If you're asked a yes-no question, there's something particularly clean and lawyerly by simply responding yes or no, or even it depends, and nothing more. Trust the professor to follow up and ask you why, or it depends on what. As I've emphasized in my lecture on responsiveness, you'll get extra points in the professor's mind regardless of whether your answer is correct or incorrect just by tracking the question and responding to it succinctly. I routinely ask my students to intentionally give a wrong answer sometime during the semester in class without telling me or their fellow students when they are fulfilling the assignment. In addition, I sometimes email students in advance of class calling upon them to give a particular wrong answer to a particular question. I do this to intentionally make it harder for others in the class and for me to tell whether a particular incorrect answer was intentional or unintentional. Students quickly learn that the world doesn't come to an end if they or a fellow classmate answer incorrectly. If you find yourself really stressing out about participating in class, you might try a 10 or 16 week course in cognitive behavioral therapy which has been shown in randomized trials to have great success in helping people overcome their fear of public speaking. You might also enlist your professor's help in becoming more comfortable in class participation. Most professors, if asked outside class, would be happy to help you develop a graduated program of slowly escalating participation. For example, you might agree to begin by making a comment prepared in advance about a particular case. Then the professor might uh, warn you that he or she was going to ask you a particular question in class about an upcoming case. Then the professor might warn you that he would be calling upon you to answer a question about an upcoming case without telling you what the question would be. After this kind of warm up, you might be ready for cold calling without any warning. Finally, here's a bonus tool that might be pulled out in emergency. If you're asked how you think a case should be decided and you don't have a clue about how to answer, you might pause, rub your chin, and then say, to answer that question, I think we should ask ourselves what outcome the future parties are rooting for. Or more simply, we should ask ourselves who are the future parties rooting for? Unquote. Desperate times sometimes call uh, for ending a sentence with a preposition. I claim that there is a good chance your professor uh, in hearing this, who are the future parties rooting for answer, that your professor will be impressed. So what the heck does the answer mean? Well, it's, it's tied to the discussion in both my ex ante ex post lecture and my veil of ignorance lecture. Uh, the future parties are in the ex-ante position with regard to the uh, dispute in question. While ex-post the suit being filed, plaintiffs and defendants are naturally in the opposition. Uh, they're in the ex-post position. But ex-ante, there's likely to be more agreement about what outcome is efficient and equitable. After the fact, a car company may not want to be held liable for a defective a gasoline tank. But ex ante, there's a better chance that car manufacturers generally would support regulation that's going to make it easier for them to sell cars. Answering a normative question by asking who or what the future parties are rooting for 
is a way not only to impress your professor and buy some time, but it hopefully will lead you uh, under follow-up questioning to make an argument about what the future parties would likely agree to, about what, uh, about what from the ex-ante perspective is efficient and equitable way to resolve disputes of this kind. One of the surest ways to screw up an issue spotting question is to fail to spot and discuss an important issue that your law professor believes is important. To reduce the chance of making this error, part of your preparation for any exam should be, should be to create a major issue summary sheet with your assessment of the top 50 issues that were covered in the class. On an open book exam, you should force your eyes over this list of issues and ask yourself proactively whether the issue is raised by the exam question. This requires a bit of discipline. Under the stress of an exam, you'll often read the question and want to jump in and immediately write about the issues that come first to mind. But it's better to spend a few extra moments to assess additional issues that might be put in play. On closed book exams, you should still prepare your summary issue sheet, but you will need to go further and try to memorize the list of potential issues. Then, when you're taking the exam, you should cast your mind back and again ask which of the issues are raised by the question. Once you've identified a set of issues that might be at play, you then need to decide which of the issues you want to discuss in your answer and at what length. In timed, exam, it's, timed exams, it's usually not possible to fully discuss all potential issues. In deciding uh, what to discuss, you should think about whether it's better to deploy the shotgun strategy of addressing a large number of issues in less depth or the rifle strategy of addressing a smaller number of issues in more depth. Each strategy can be appropriate in certain circumstances. The shotgun is preferred when you're less sure about what the professor is looking for. By mentioning a large number of issues, you'll reduce the chance that you screw up and fail to mention an important issue at all. The shotgun strategy is a great way of turning a C or a D grade into a B, but the shotgun approach is not a great way to turn a B grade into an A. To get an A on a question, you'll probably have to provide more analysis of a smaller set of issues. When you're more confident about what the professor is looking for, you might instead pull out the rifle and focus your limited time in covering the most pertinent issues. On some exams, you might deploy the shotgun strategy to answer the first question and turn around and deploy the rifle strategy to answer the next question. As you write your exam, keep in mind your audience, a sleepy professor. Reading law exams is like having to watch a bad movie 60 times in a row. People do not create great art under uh, the time pressure of an exam. It's often unpleasant and mind dulling to read. You can improve the experience of your professor by including in your answer judicious use of underlining or bolding or highlighting. And you should definitely break your discussion of issues into separate paragra paragraphs and possibly separate them with individual section headings. Writing answers that are single run-on paragraphs for pages without any highlighted words are ill-conceived uh, for at least two reasons. First, uh, these undifferentiated mass of words make it harder for professors to skip your discussion of silly issues. When I'm grading an exam, I sometimes read an answer that wastes time on an issue that's not at all relevant to the question. I'd like to jump ahead to the point where the student starts to discuss another issue instead of uh, focusing my attention on something that's annoying me about the student. 
but if there are no paragraphs or highlighting, I'm forced to keep reading the poor parts of the answer and can't focus my time on the parts where the student is saying something more intelligent. Second, have you ever had the experience of reading a novel late at night and suddenly find that you've zoned out and can't remember what you've read for the last several pages? This experience happens to professors all the time when they're uh, grading exams. When the student has used paragraphs and, uh, and, uh, and underlined key words, I'm often able to go back and remind myself of the student's key points. But when there is an undifferentiated string of sentences, it becomes much harder for me to figure out how far I need to go back. And, and what were the key points? Arg! That does not make me happy. The bottom line is that you should keep in mind that your exam falls in the midst of dozens of others. And you should strive to make it easy for your professor to extract the information from your exam. Students often wonder whether on their exams they can criticize arguments that the professor made in class. The answer is yes, but in doing this, be sure to regurgitate the professor's argument before you take it on and criticize it. Make clear that you attended class, possibly even referencing class discussion, and, then, and that you understood what was argued before you dispute it. On policy questions, I sometimes encounter answers that show no inkling of the class discussion on the particular topic, and I tend to give lower grades to these answers. Finally, it's, a, uh, it's standard advice, but it's so important to keep track of time. I routinely encounter exams where a student leaves some answer completely blank. Many professors are inclined to give uh, partial credit for incomplete answers, but we can't give partial credit for an answer that doesn't exist. So whatever you do, make sure that you leave enough time to, uh, <coughs> to say something to uh, so that you can receive at least partial credit on every question. And finally, here's a bonus tool. In trying to identify issues, pay particular attention to fact patterns where the same conduct occurs twice or more. Ask yourself, what are the differences between these repeated events? Professors in crafting exam questions often repeat an event with slight variations to highlight an issue uh, that they want you to discuss in your answer. Congratulations for making it through the, these lectures. You've now had an introduction to some central concepts. As you encounter these concepts again and again in law school, you'll naturally become more adept at manipulating them. But having an initial understanding is very likely to help you digest the rules that you encounter in your class materials. Of course, there's some arbitrariness in what gets included and excluded in any attempt at defining a canon of foundational concepts. Bob Dylan wrote the song, A Hard Rain's Gonna Fall, during the midst of the 1962 Cuba Missile Crisis, and said that its lyrics were the initial lines of all the songs, quote, he thought he would never have time to write, unquote. In this postscript, I'm going to mention five more tools that I didn't have time to include. More information about them is just a web search away. So first, flowcharts. Uh, flowcharts lay out the disjunctive, conjunctive elements of a cause of action. Rule 403, probity versus prejudice. This rule tells you, is a rule of evidence that tells you that there's a basic tension between some pieces of evidence that are both um, relevant and provide probative evidence, but also might prejudice the jury. I think of, as a canonical example, a bloody photograph. The next rule I didn't really have time to talk about 
are, is mens rea. Uh, the, the states of mind are very important to several areas of law. If you innocently misrepresent something, you're not a liar. And the categories of mens rea include willful, wanton, malicious, intentional, gross negligence, negligence, and non-negligent. But for versus proximate cause. X is a but for cause of Y if Y would not have happened if X had not happened. But there's also this concept of proximate cause that something need not be just a, a but for cause in order to, uh, uh, in order for there to be legal liability. You also have to have it something close in the causal chain. So uh, my uh, parents conceiving of me was a but for cause of me giving these lectures, but it's not a proximate cause. Uh, the next tool I really couldn't talk about is arguing in the alternative. And here's, it's a very lawyerly task, uh, a way of thinking. Um, if you're accused of murder, you might respond, I didn't do it, but if I did, uh, I was drunk. And if I wasn't drunk, it was in self-defense, uh, arguing in the alternative. Uh, rhetorical advices. Uh, these, like the canons of interpretation, often have fancy Latin names. Uh, it turns out that Ward Farnsworth has a great book on these two. There, uh, and uh, you can at least decorate your conversations by when you can recognize that somebody is using a re particular rhetorical device. And once you know them, it's easier, easier for you to deploy them yourself in your writing and in your oral advocacy. I wish I had had time to teach you about some specific rhetorical devices. Like the uh, um, canons of interpretation, rhetorical devices often have fancy Latin names. It, it turns out that Ward Farnsworth has a great book on these too. Uh, if you learn a few of the core devices, it will allow you to, first of all, recognize when someone is using them in their argumentation, but it also gives you a greater capacity to deploy them in your own writing and your own oral advocacy. So there are, of course, many, many more tools, but having this introduction to the 30 or more rules that we've already gone over, you're in a much better place to go out and start learning them yourself. Thanks for sticking it out with me.